I'm very pleased to be invited to come here. This is my third uh, such conference, and I've spoken to the other two and enjoyed them enormously. This is my special week because I'm among so many friends, unlike at the University of Houston where I teach. <laughs> I'll mention, uh, some of you know I write quite a lot. I'm kind of a compulsive writer. I never planned to do that, but it seems like that's the turn my life has taken. I just want to mention I've, I guess I've written close to 300 articles for Forbes, and I'm now writing for Newsmax. Uh, I have a weekly column, and if any of you would like to uh, get on my list, I'd be pleased to take your business cards or names with carefully written emails on them because one digit or one dot that's off doesn't work. Uh, so if if you would like to get those, uh, you know, those get on that list, I'd be very pleased to uh, do that. First, I want to do a reality check. Would you raise your hand, please, if you seriously imagine that our president, Barack Obama, at least some of our president, not all of your presidents, has ever given a serious moment of thought to a global crisis of warming, particularly uh, anthropogenic global warming. Would you raise your hands if you actually believe he lays awake at night worrying about this? <laughs> Is there any, anyone out there? Oh, that's a relief. I thought I was maybe going to be the most skeptical one in the bunch here. <laughs> As uh, some of you may have observed, climate changes and it's been doing so for a really, really long time, and, and it actually started before the Industrial Revolution, if you will believe that. Matter of fact, and Patrick Moore mentioned that this morning, I thought they were wonderful talks this morning. Then the past century, we've witnessed two distinct warming periods and cooling periods. The first one was between 1900 or 1910 and 1945, and that period, which is pretty much identical to the last uh, decade, accounted for about half of all the estimated warming up to this point in time. And as was mentioned this morning, since carbon dioxide levels are higher today, uh, certainly than they were at that time, it's very suspicious that carbon dioxide was the issue that raised the temperatures, as Patrick Moore said, from 1910 to 1945. Uh, the second warming that, that was reported in uh, surface thermometers, but not by satellites, began around 1975 and had continued at a fairly constant rate until 1988, 1998 rather, in a very strong Pacific ocean El Nino year, and temperatures have been flat now since most all young people in high school were born. Uh, the IPCC has recently admitted that climate sensitivity, their estimates have been, you know, were exaggerated. Uh, it's, far less, sensitivity is far less than, uh, than they had previously estimated based upon their models. But somehow they're even more certain that we're responsible for more than half of the warming, so go figure. Yep, uh, we experienced warming from 1940s to late to the late uh, 1970s at a time when many prominent scientists were predicting the next ice age is coming. New York Times is saying, you know, the ice age cometh and, and we saw headlines of uh, New York City being swallowed by glaciers and so on. And then you think that f following that uh, period, 1998 to present, uh, and, and particularly from from from, uh, from 
1988 to from 1970s, late 70s to 1988. All of a sudden, there was a climate crisis. This was like half of a climate cycle. You know, this was like 12 years later. All of a sudden, not only is the is the world on fire, but we're causing it. So the alarmism from the next ice age to the notion, oh my gosh, you know, we're at a tipping point and, and we're doomed, happened in a very short period of time. Uh, less than half a climate cycle, whereas the previous cooling cycle had been a full climate cycle, depending on when you start and stop these things, of course. So the UN wasted no time at all to use this as an excuse for wealth distribution, redistribution, and they established the IPCC in 1988 to prove that not only was there a crisis, but it was human caused. And they had lots of help. They had help, for example, from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Remember back in 19, late 80s, uh, Soviet Union was cratering, and Union of Concerned Scientists had been devoted to nuclear disarmament, and all of a sudden their great cause went away. And they needed a new, a new reason for existing. So there was a much circulated New York Times uh, article that presented that global warming was a new danger to mankind. It was signed by 700 people, including members of the National Academy of Sciences, and they had some Nobel laureates who signed it as well, about 700, as I mentioned. Very few of them had been, hadn't been involved in climatology. And the president of the National Academy warned the members in the 1990 annual meeting not to lend their credentials to issues which they had no special knowledge of. That went on largely unheeded. Not allowing a perfectly good crisis to go to waste, remember Senator Al Gore entered the stage of climate alarmism in 1988 with his carefully scripted Committee on Science, Technology, and Space Hearings. And it was co-planned by another, his, his partner, Senator uh, Timothy Wirth. As reported in a PBS interview by Wirth, quote, we called the Weather Bureau and found, that what, found out what was historically the hottest day of the summer. So we scheduled a hearing on that day. And bingo, it was the hottest day on record in Washington, or close to it. We went in the night before and we opened all the windows so the air conditioning wasn't working inside the room. Timothy Wirth emerged again in a sweaty climate scene as Clinton Gore Administrator's Undersecretary of State for Global Affairs at the UN-sponsored 1992 Earth Summit Conference held in June of that year, leaving little doubt about his priorities. And he told the audience at that summit, quote, we've got to ride the global warming issue. Even if the theory of global warming is wrong, we'll be doing the right thing in terms of economic policy and environmental policy. Well, the right thing for whom? Uh, Dr. Moore spoke this morning, as, 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 he, as you mentioned, he was uh, he left, uh, is a Greenpeace co-founder, he left the organization in 1986 after it strayed away from objective science. And uh, some years ago he gave a Fox Business News interview and he was asked, well, who's, who benefits from this? Who's, who's behind the alarmism? And at that point he said, quote, a powerful convergence of interests Scientists seeking grant money, media seeking headlines, universities seeking huge grants from major institutions, foundations, environmental groups, politicians wanting to make it look like they're saving future generations, and all of these have converged on the issues. University of Manchester professor emeritus in chemical, of chemical and thermodynamics, Leslie Woodcock, observed that the green lobby, and you observed this recently, has created a quote, do good industry. And I like that, I like that term. 
In a recent interview with Britain's Yorkshire Evening Post, he said, quote, if you talk to real scientists who have no political interest, they'll tell you there's nothing in global warming. It's an industry which creates vast amounts of money for some people. I want to mention very briefly that uh, I, I, I was pretty innocent on all this stuff uh, up until a few years ago when Fred Singer, you know, I'm a space guy, and Fred Singer is a founder of the first you know, the U.S. Weather Satellite Service, and, and he was in my office. We were talking about space stuff, esoteric stuff about Phobos and Deimos and how it's better to go there before we go to the surface of Mars and that kind of stuff. And he mentioned that the satellites were telling a different story than the, the surface temperatures were. That no hot spot that had been predicted over the tropical troposphere and the equator was, was evident in the, by the satellites, and therefore, you know, there was, that was supposed to be the, the, the human foot fingerprint. And I, I didn't think much of it at the time. It wasn't my interest, and in, particularly, I wasn't particularly interested in climate. And it wasn't until some years, maybe a year or two later, that I was, began thinking about designing life support systems for spacecraft, and I thought, well, maybe we can learn something from the way climate works that we can apply to spacecraft, which is crazy, it's still crazy, because climate's really dynamic, and stuff we do in spacecrafts are really simple, stupid chemical stuff. But it got me into the science, and the more I got into it, particularly reading climate history and Lamb's work and so on, I realized that something was seriously amiss, and so my light bulb went off when I read Gore's, uh, when he was quoted as saying, speaking before, in a big, speaking on behalf of cap and trade in 2007 in a joint house hearing on energy science committee. And he said, he said at that time, as soon as carbon is a price, we're gonna see a wave of investment. It'll, it'll be unchained investment. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty telling. You know, that's, maybe this wasn't all about uh, the science after all. I'm going to, in fact, I completely forgot my, to advance the slides. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Climate's been happening for a long time. It's in a, these are some illustrations from my book. I did the illustrations and wrote the book, so I, I think they like this one. But uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to close. I'm going to uh, very much fast forward here. and uh, leave you with these thoughts. No sane person will deny that dramatic, often abrupt climate changes have been occurring throughout our planet's history. No informed person will believe that such events have become more frequent or severe since the time of the Industrial Revolution, the past few decades in particular. No honest person will claim an ability to predict the long-term future, warmer or cooler, for better or worse, based upon highly theoretical climate models which entirely omit poorly understood influences. No honorable scientist will compromise objective research principles through omissions of unknowns and uncertainties in order to influence political policy agendas. And no concerned citizen should be willing to tolerate abuses of science and public trust that incite climate alarmism to impose unwarranted economic burdens which fall heaviest upon those who, least, who can least afford them. Thank you very much.